You are listening to The Gateway Church, located in Ferrisburg, Michigan. You can learn more about us by visiting thegateway.church or like and follow us on Facebook, where you can watch full services, keep up with all that is going on, and get connected. Well, have I told you lately that I'm glad you're here? I really am. I'm so glad you're here. And I just want to say to the guests that are here, uh, you are an answer to prayer. We've been praying for you, and really, all of you are an answer to prayer. We are glad that you're here, and we've been in a summer series called The Test, uh, studying the life of Joseph, and we're going to dive right in, and I realized this week that after today's message, we will be over halfway through this summer series, and you know what that means. The summer is over half. <laughs> Halfway over. Sorry to bear the bad news. <laughs> and we've declared it as a summer of dreams, amen, and a summer of building character. And we've been looking at the life of Joseph, and, and we've been getting into God's Word and the book of Genesis, and it's been life to us. And I love the fact that God's Word is a real book with real life stories and real people and real role models like Joseph. Now, Joseph was not perfect, but he was pretty great, and he's a good example. And he's been an example to us as we've looked at uh, the pride test and the pit test and the palace test, right? And we've looked at these tests, and, and we started our series here and saying, okay, we got to struggle with pride. We do that. The pit is like in a terrible circumstance. What do we do? Uh, we, we turn to God. The palace test, the stewardship test, that's when we, uh, whatever we find our hands to do, we do it with all our might. And then last week, well, Pastor Ben McBride spoke on the purity test, and that is a huge topic. And, and uh, I walked away last week saying, you know what? We need to do a series on purity, and we're going to pray about it, look at it, and, and plan it in the future. But when you look at the story through the lens of Joseph, Joseph ends up in the palace, right? He's under Potiphar's leadership, and he has everything in his control except Potiphar's wife. And then verse 7 says that Potiphar's wife started to look lustfully after Joseph. And how many know, men and women, it often will start sin with our eyes, where we focus our eyes. And then she propositions him, says, come sleep with me. Verse 10, she just keeps on pressuring, but Joseph refused to sleep with her and kept out of her way as much as possible, it says in verse 10. Verse 11, though, is the tricky one, right? And this is something we got to be careful of. And then it says, one day when no one else was around. Oof. And let's look at it. Verse 12, we'll pick it up there. Verse 12 says, She came and grabbed Joseph by the cloak, demanding, Come, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand, and he ran from the house. And last week was a starting point for us to say, All right, we need to be training ourselves for purity. And Joseph, I'm thinking, if I was in his shoes, he's a slave, a Hebrew slave, seemingly nothing to lose if he succumbs to this temptation, right? But Joseph did the right thing. He ran. He was not about to sacrifice his purity or his integrity to please his master's wife. And that's the kind of training we need to be able to run, to be courageous, to to walk away, to have self-control. And last week we ended with three kind of uh, next steps. And I want to just put these up one last time because I think it's so important. It really, when we're dealing with purity, it starts with confession and then it moves to counseling oftentimes and then covenant eyes. Three C's for you, right? And uh, confession. We need to confess our sin one to another. And if there's an issue in purity, find someone you trust and confess. And the Bible says when you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you. It starts there. If you need counseling, we support a couple counseling centers, and we will funnel you in those directions if you need help to make those things happen. Trust me, it is worth it to take some time and get counseling. And then Covenant Eyes is a tool. It's a great tool. I've used it for, uh, it seems like, almost 20 years uh, Uh, I think 19 or 20 years for me. But uh, Covenant Eyes is a tool of accountability, and we would provide that 
respect for you, for your family, for no charge. That's how much we are committed to helping you live pure. And so, and I get it. If you're saying, okay, um, I, I, I could probably benefit from that. Um, but it's, there is a step that you might need to take to say, okay, I need some help in this area. And I promise you there will be no shame, right? We're not going to throw you under the bus. We're just going to help you make the connection with Covenant Eyes, and we will pay for it for your family or for you as an individual, and we would love to make those connections. And so we sent out an email this week with the instructions of how to do that. If you are not on our email list, come and talk to one of the pastors, uh, and we will make sure that you connect in that way. Because when we look at Joseph's story, it's a great example, right? He didn't uh, lose his character. He might have lost his coat that day, but he didn't lose his character. And when we talk about character, uh, I want to just hone in on this for a moment. You're not born with character. It's something that's developed, something that is uh, learned over time. And oftentimes it takes a lot of time, but it takes a lot of time to build it, but you can lose it in an instant. And Joseph miss that opportunity by being pure and running. And, uh, and it's so important for us to be able to know and see and to do the same thing as Joseph. Now, Joseph's destiny was great, right? He had this big dream, and it was God's plan. And the same is true for every single one of us. It's true for you that, we, that you have a plan. God has a plan. And the big destiny that God has for you needs to be supported with big character. And so that's why we're looking at these uh, character traits. And character is often developed uh, as we are subjected to adversity. And I know that that's hard, and that's what we're going to wrestle with today. But let's set up the story. Joseph, he runs from Potiphar's house, right? He does the right thing. He's being obedient to his Lord and master. And you might think, if you didn't read the story or you don't know the story, you might think, okay, he does the right thing. He's headed towards more prosperity, right? Well, That's wrong. In fact, what you might expect, Joseph gets the exact opposite. He gets more trouble. And that sets up today what we're going to talk about uh, here for the next few moments. When you do the right thing and get a bad result, it is the prison test. And that's what we're going to talk about, the prison test. And many times it's the longest of all the tests. It can last days, months, even years. And it's not just seen in Joseph's story. This is not an isolated thing in Scripture. This is something that we all will deal with. We see it throughout. In fact, John chapter 16, verse 33, uh, it says in the middle of the verse there, here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, right? And so the truth of that, look at it there, is, is that that just happens. Storms come, they hit the just and the unjust, if you've done everything right or if you've done things wrong, and that we're going to experience some trouble, and that's what happens to Joseph. Let's pick up the story. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 39, and we'll start in verse 12 again. It says, she came and grabbed him by the cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me. And Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. Verse 13, when she saw that she was holding his cloak and had fled, she called out to her servants. Soon the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave you brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. Potiphar was furious, and rightfully so, when he heard his wife's story. And let's just remember, this is a story, wasn't factual, about Joseph, how he had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. Joseph ends up in a dungeon, accused of rape or attempted rape, which should have resulted in death, 
but God was with him, and we'll see that here in a moment. It's kind of a triple blow for, for Joseph as, we, as we've tracked his life to this point. He ends up in prison, the Egyptian pits. And the question that wrestles in my mind, and you might be thinking even this morning, where is God in all of this? Where is God in this story? There's a scandal on our hands, right? And I'm curious, how many of you have ever been there, right? Where you've done the right thing, but suffered wrong consequences. You've been accused of something that you did not do, or you did not say, or maybe you did say or didn't say, and you've been misunderstood. Maybe you've been lied to, or rumors have spread, Did I even need to ask how many of you have been there? Because we've all been there at some point or another. In fact, I really struggled with this message. I had a a good plan on Monday. In fact, we talked, Pastor Doug and I talked about it. And then as I looked at it again Thursday and Friday and Saturday, I literally didn't print my notes until 8 o'clock this morning. And I'm thinking, that is very unusual. But when I think about that setup and think about what's going on here, I have some PTSD, I think, around this because I've been there. And so you've lived and if you've, you have probably had similar situations where, where, especially when you rise in leadership in any capacity, there will be things, rumors or lies or misunderstandings that everyone experiences hardship and injustice and your character becomes in question and it's not fun. And I was thinking, you know what? We need to prepare our kids for this, right? Uh, Parents, how many are with me, right? We need to train our kids uh, to walk through these times that are character builders. We need to teach our kids and remind ourselves that hardship and injustice are not the deciding factors in our lives. Instead, we need to wrestle with how we respond when we are facing circumstances like Joseph did. And if we respond in the right way, church, character is developed. Robert Morris says character is simply doing the right thing in the wrong situation. And as we do that, there should be some hope that is found in the story, right? Hope in the process. Character development leads to hope. And I find that in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, it says this, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And that in, the word endurance is the word perseverance, and we'll see that in a minute. And endurance develops strength of character. That's the crux of this message. Not, verse number four, you can highlight it. And endurance or perseverance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope. And this hope will not lead us to disappointment. Joseph in our story is a slave, right? He's been slandered. He's been forgotten. He's in the depths of suffering, but God is still at work. And today, as we wrestle with the prison test, it's really a test of perseverance, of enduring. And perseverance does produce character. And Joseph is a great example. Uh, Let's dive into the test of perseverance. When you think about persevering or patience, those are two things that I've been encouraged uh, to never pray for, right? You should never pray for patience because you might get the opportunity to be patient, right? And uh, it's interesting. And this is different than making a mistake and paying the consequences. Today is wrestling with the idea of what happens when you're accused and it's not your fault. When there's a falsehood shared about your life and you're innocent, someone lies, spreads a false rumor, there's unjust just, uh, uh, accusation, unjust suffering, enduring injustice. And that's where we'll pick up in Joseph's story. What did Joseph do in this circumstance? Let's look at it. Verse 19 it says, Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. And if the story ended there, we almost would be like, well, that's, that's, uh, that's about right. 
But verse 21 is highlighted in my scripture. I would encourage you to do the same. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden, with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all of the other prisoners and over everything that happened in prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. Does that sound familiar? In Joseph's life, he's given all this responsibility. And then it says again, the Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. What I read in here is that Joseph had a positive attitude. He was a standout. His attitude was great. And not only was his attitude great, his heart was pure. He was falling back on previous character tests that he's already been through. He's working as unto the Lord wherever he finds his hands, right? And, and I love that. And the truth is, is Joseph was faithful where he was planted. And how many know that fruit comes when we're faithful, when we're faithful, good things happen. But you look at the circumstance and say, how can you be faithful? Seriously. You think of Joseph, and I'm thinking, okay, he could have fought back. He could have tried to get even. Joseph could have got bitter with, towards his brothers, towards the Egyptians, towards God himself. He could have had a victim mentality. How many know, don't raise your hand, how, we all know someone with a victim mentality, Right? He could have had a pity parter, pity parter, pit party. He could have been disappointed. In fact, he probably was disappointed. He was in a tough spot. Was Joseph wounded? Absolutely. But he could have shut himself down, checked out, become cynical. But he was faithful. How can you be faithful? Remember, Joseph doesn't know the end of the story at this point. And I think the answer to this question, how can you be faithful when everything is going sideways? It lies in a deep belief, a deep trust in the Lord that God is good. See, perseverance develops character. That's going to be the overriding idea. But trust is the key to persevering. Trust, saying, okay, I know life is out of control, but I trust you, God. This circumstance that is out of my control, but Lord, I'm putting my belief, my faith in you. And that's what we see here, Joseph, uh, with Joseph. God is at work 24-7. When you move into chapter 40, uh, uh, there's an opportunity for God to be working, right? God is orchestrating the cupbearer and the baker to have problems with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh throws them into prison. And then the prison warden puts Joseph over uh, Pharaoh's men. And, uh, and then what's great is that Joseph is just not overwhelmed with his own grief. He's serving. He's prospering even in prison. And he notices the Pharaoh's men are sad one day. And he comes to him in Genesis 40, verses 6 and 7. He says, when Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. You only see that because he's aware. He's not wallowing in his own misery. Why do you look so worried today, he asked them. And God was setting up a divine appointment for Joseph. In the same way that God will set up divine appointments for every single one of us if we trust him, if we put our faith in him. And just a side note, if you're consumed with your problems, and I'm not minimizing what you might be facing, but if you're consumed with them, you will miss divine appointments. And so I want to encourage you to be faithful, to trust God, and get your head out of the clouds, right, or out of the sheets, Joseph was serving in the midst of trouble. He was not waiting for it to be delivered before he could be used again. There's something different about Joseph that we want to glean. And he's not the only one in Scripture. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1. I love what he says. He says, this is Paul. I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains. He's in prison. This is one of the prison epistles because of Christ. 
And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. Trusting God. Wow. There's something different about Joseph. There's something different about Paul. There should be something different about us. A deep trust in the Lord. It reminds me of the verse that I uh, learned uh, early on in life, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In fact, Jessica wrote this in a Bible that she presented to me when I graduated high school. You remember that, Jess? I still have that Bible. I should have brought it. But she wrote in there a nice little love note, encouragement. It was all because we were so spiritual. She gave me a Bible. And she wrote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord and me. <laughs> no, I, didn't. I know she didn't say that. But trust in the Lord, right, with all your heart. And depend not on your own understanding. In the NLT, it says, seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Trust, believing. And I'm, I, what happens is when you trust and believe over time, perseverance is developed. Perseverance. See, trusting also, you've got to trust in God's time. And I just want to make note, we're not going to look at it long, but in chapter 40, verse 1, and then chapter 41, verse 1, look what it says, respectively. It says, sometime later, so this is after Joseph was thrown into prison, Potter, Potiphar's chief cupbearer and chief baker were offending the royal master and thrown into prison. And then in verse, chapter 41, it says, two years later... And then Pharaoh's dreams take off, and that's going to be next week as we look at the power test, and uh, that'll be really good. But, um, but what happened is between these two chapters was a lot of time. And not only did Joseph learn to trust God's time and to trust him, believe him, learn to persevere, but he learned to trust God's word in that season as well. Because we see, even when you read it, we're not going to take the time, but Joseph interpreted some dreams of the cupbearer and the chief um, uh, and the chief baker. It was the first time we see Joseph interpreting a word from the Lord. And so, and by the way, he gives him gives God the credit, and rightfully so. But it's trusting, learning to believe that you hear from God, and trusting God's ways, what God allows. Trusting how God reconciles stuff, uh, it can be confusing. It can be hard. And it was probably hard for Joseph. But in our own darkest days, we can trust just like Joseph did. You say, well, how do we persevere? Well, if you've ever had a friend that has abandoned you, or if you've ever loved a spouse and then they've kind of left and ripped you off, or if you've ever given something to someone and they never paid you back, or if you've ever worked with a partner in business and the business went sideways, things fell apart, if you've ever had a, someone uh, had a false statement said against you, it's painful. And again, you can be in this circumstance and say, I don't understand what's happening. How do you repair the slander or the falsehood? How do you get past the injustice or the, the whatever is unfair? And that's what we want to wrestle with. How do you just say, God, why me? Why us? Why my family? Why my loved ones? How do we not become a victim in the story? How do we persevere? Again, the key to trust is to believe. And the answer is not always easy but we throw our full weight on Jesus. And when we trust and persevere, it will build our character. And others will see it. It's so true. Now, if I was writing this story, if I was in charge of the Bible, it'd like, you know, I would have pulled Joseph out. I would have pulled Joseph out of the pit early on. I would have pulled him out of prison. I would have pulled him out of the pain. And most of the parents in the room, and I say most, I hope all of us, we, I, there's something inside of us, like when our kids are struggling or facing injustice, we want to step in and fight for them, right? But, but what happens, God allowed this to happen. And if I would have 
stepped in and pulled Joseph out, or if we would have done that collectively, it would have cheated nations out of the one God would use to deliver the people from famine. You say, what are you talking about? Well, you back it up. There was a promise from God in Genesis chapter 15. And if Joseph was not in prison for those extra two years, he would have never been called upon by Pharaoh in his dream, a divine appointment that was going to be set up two years later. You say, what kind of plan was that? Well, in Genesis chapter 15, uh, God says uh, to Abraham, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. But I will punish the nation that enslaves them, and in the end, they will come away with great wealth. And so there's this prophetic word, this prophecy, this promise from God, and Joseph was a fulfillment of that. And we're going to see that unfold over the next several weeks. There was a promise fulfilled through Joseph, even though Joseph had all this adversity. This would have been at risk if God would have pulled him out of that story. Now, as I was reading the, and studying this week, I'm reading through the book of Hebrews right now, and in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, a verse jumped out of me. I wanted to just throw it in. You can write it down. It says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. I love that. And boy, it relates to the story. God was fulfilling his promise through Joseph in the story. Back to Romans chapter 5, we showed that earlier in verse 4. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope, right? And this hope will not be disappointed. And so in other words, when we trust, we believe. It's not a blind trust or blind hope, and it's not without hope. When we put our faith in God, we can hope that he's working, that he's moving that his promises are good. But sometimes there's a little endurance that's needed in the process. Joseph, it was 13 years. And next week we're going to step into that 13th year and Joseph kind of takes off from there. Abraham, when he had a promise from God that he was going to be the father of many nations, it was 25 years later that him and his wife got pregnant and at 100 years old and 90 uh, to boot. Moses, it was 40 years in the wilderness. David was anointed king as a young man, right? And it took 13 years before he was actually appointed king. That's a lot of enduring. And even Paul, the apostle Paul, was uh, anointed as an apostle, but it was 13 years later that he started his first missionary journey. So, if you're in a spot today and you're in a season of persevering, you're in the trouble, and especially if you've been misunderstood um, or you're falsely accused in some way, if you don't understand, you say, man, the struggle, I, I'm having a hard time understanding. Where can we turn a verse that just screams to me, and it's actually a bridge between this week and next week, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, says this. Each time he said, this is Jesus saying, my grace is sufficient, or my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. It says, so I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That is why I take pleasure in my weakness and in insults, being misunderstood, hardships, persecutions, and trouble that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The Lord is at work in our lives. And today... I want to speak that over us. I want everyone to stand right where you are. And uh, I'm going to read just straight from my notes here, uh, kind of a prophetic 
word over us that I wrote earlier in the week and brought it in. And it really will set up the song that we're going to sing here in a momentarily. The song is called Never Leave. And, and I just want to encourage you to come to Jesus if you're struggling. But this is the word of the Lord for you today. God is working everything out for our good right now. God loves us and is going to care for us right now. We are at the center of God's will right now. In the last phrase, God is with us right now. And I don't know what you're facing, what trouble you may be in, whether it was being falsely accused or you just got yourself in trouble and you might deserve it. I don't know. But whatever it is, God is right there with you. And he's for you. And he wants to do a great work. He wants to help you learn to persevere, learn to get through it. And that's what we want to end with this morning. I'm going to read this one more time. And as I do, I want us just to lift our hands and close our eyes. And I want you just to start to cry out to the Lord. Just thank him right now for what he's doing. Even if you're in a season of hardship, even in a tough time. Oh God, I pray. Hallelujah. I'm going to read this one more time. God is working everything out for our good right now. God loves us and is going to care for us right now. We are in the center of God's will right now. And God is with us right now. Come on, let's lift, continue to lift our hands, cry out to God, and let this song be a blessing. God is working everything out for your good right now. He loves us and is going to care for us right now. We're in the center of God's will right now. God is with us right now. And I understand that there are some in the room that certainly don't feel that way. And it's part of life. And whether it's by your choice or someone else's choice or unexpected misunderstandings, slanders. God is with you. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20, it says, of course, you get no credit for being patient or enduring or learning perseverance if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. And then over the next few verses, look what it says. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering just as Christ suffered. He is your example. You must follow in his steps. Joseph is a pretty good example to follow, but the ultimate example is Jesus Christ. It goes on to say he never sinned. He never deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted. He never threatened to revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. I love that. Today, no matter what you're facing we hold it in our hands lightly and we declare God is the one at work. He's our example. If you're here today and you're just saying, you know, Pastor, I'm in a season that's tough. I'm in the prison. I feel like I'm in the pit. I want you just to lift right where you are. Lift your hand. And uh, I and I want you to keep it up here for a second. And for, the, for those, I just want us to look around. And we got hands all over. I want you just to slide and find someone. Let's make sure anyone with their hand up, make, keep your hand up until someone comes and puts their hand on your shoulder. Let's just minister to these those that are around us. And let's just ask the Lord just to, to, uh, to work. Oh, God, we ask, Lord, as we close today, Lord, I pray that you would just do a mighty work, God. 
Lord, that we are here and we're here together. Lord, the folks, the families with their hands raised, they're not alone. And God, I just speak word, the word of life into them. And Lord, that they would trust you. They would believe, Lord, that you're working even behind the scenes. And Lord, that that trust will build perseverance over time and perseverance building character. And God, I know that for some you're saying, all right, I've got enough character. But Lord, I pray that you just continue the work, continue to move in every circumstance today that's difficult. And God will give you the praise and all the glory even through the circumstance. I'm just reminded of the Apostle Paul in prison, and he's worshiping, he's praising God. (laughs) Lord, help that to be our response, no matter what. God, that you're with us, you love us, you're with us right now. Hallelujah. And church, as as we close here in the next moment, I often will pray a prayer benediction that God would go before us, behind us, and all around us. How many of you have heard me say that about 100 times? Yeah, we've all heard that, right? And, uh, and I, I want to speak that in light of today's message, that we go trusting, believing, no matter what we face, that God is with us. And so, Lord, I pray that you go before us, behind us, and all around us, and bring us back together again for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen. We love you. God bless you. Go in the grace of God. Thank you for listening to this week's message from the Gateway Church. If you'd like to find out more about our church, such as service times, giving, and ways to get connected, visit us at thegateway.church.